the lasting beauty of inner character. And they all submitted to their husbands. I'll go on to something else. <laughs> the wives of the others are again a contrast to the wives of the men of faith. There's an unusual shaped mountain at the south end of the Dead Sea called Lot's Wife. It's the shape of a woman running away. But the, even Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. She looked back to the comfortable life they were leaving, yet a life that was going to be judged by God. They lived in Sodom, a name that's become infamous in history. Well, that's what we're looking for when we read these chapters. We're looking for faith and flesh and the contrast between men and their wives. And you begin to understand why God says, I belong to this side of the family and not to this side. Let's just look at those three men in perhaps a little greater detail. God made a promise to Abraham on which we still rely. God began creation with one man and he began redemption with one man, this man Abraham. And he made a covenant. That's a beautiful word that goes right through even to when we take bread and wine together. For this is the blood of the new covenant. But this word covenant is very precious. It is not the word contract. It's not a bargain struck between two parties of equal power and authority. A covenant is entirely made by one party to bless the other. And the other has only two choices, to accept the terms or to reject them. But they cannot change them. And God makes covenants and he keeps them. And God swears by them. Have you ever heard God swear? When man swears, he swears by a power greater than himself. He often says, by heaven I'll do that or by God I'll do that. Well, God, you see, has nobody higher to swear by. So he swears by himself. And where a human being might say, by God, I'll promise to do that. God says, by myself I have sworn. And that's how God swears on oath. By myself, because there's nothing above God to swear by. So he swears by himself and he tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And he promised Abraham, virtually a covenant is a marriage. And the key words are always I will. And if you read Genesis 12, God says six times, I will, I will, I will, I will. And the truth is that the God of the universe married himself to this particular family. And he promised them a place to live in. He gave them a, a little pit patch of land where the continents meet. The very center of the landmass of the world is Jerusalem. And that's where the road from Africa to Asia and the road from Arabia to Europe cross near a little hill called Harmageddon in Hebrew. And it's the crossroads of the world. He says, that's the place I'm going to give you forever. And they hold the title deeds to that place, whatever anybody else says, because God gave the title deeds to them, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Second thing God promised was to give them descendants, that they would always be descendants of Abraham on the earth. And the third promise was that he would use them to bless or to curse every other nation. Now that's the calling of the Jews, to share God with everybody. But that can cut both ways. God said to Abraham, those who curse you will be cursed, those who bless you will be blessed. And it is still the truth, as many have discovered. Now that was his covenant. In return, God expected first that every male Jew would be circumcised as a sign that they were born into that covenant. And second, that Abraham would obey God and do everything God told him. And that covenant is at the very heart of the Bible. And on the basis of that covenant, God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. That phrase is repeated all the way through the Bible until the very last page, and there it is again, I will be their God and they will be my people. A lovely phrase that. God wants to stick with us. 
He wants to stay with us and live with us. And as you know, at the very end of the Bible, God himself moves out of heaven and comes down to earth to live with us on a new earth forever. He wants to live with us. He wants to be family. He wants to be our father. That was the whole purpose behind creating our universe and ourselves. Well, how am I doing for time? Two minutes. Then I better begin to leave it there. I'll just say this, that uh, Jacob, the most colorful of all, the mother's boy, even when he was born, he was holding the heel of his twin brother Esau, the red-haired brother he had, grasping from the very beginning. But God dealt with him. Esau went actually to live in a place we now call Petra. Some of you may have seen these amazing temples carved out of the red sandstone. Esau went to live here and formed the nation of Edom. And the hatred between Ishmael and Isaac is still in the Middle East, between Arab and Jew. But the hatred between Esau and Jacob has gone because the last Edomites were known by the name of Herod. And it was a descendant of Esau that was king of the Jews when Jesus was born and who killed all the babies in Bethlehem to try and get rid of this descendant of Jacob who was born to be king. Finally, I'd just like to point this out. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob all showed their faith in one extraordinary way. They all, each of them, left to his son what he didn't possess. Abraham said, Son, Isaac, I'm leaving the whole land around you to you. And Isaac said to Jacob, I'm leaving the whole land to you. And Jacob said to his twelve boys, The whole land I leave in my will to you. And not one of them possessed any of it except one cave, the family vault in Hebron, the cave of Machpelah. Isn't that amazing? What faith to write a will leaving a whole land to your offspring when you've never possessed it but they believed that God had given it to them and that one day that whole land would be theirs. And finally, when I read Hebrews 11, I read about these men, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and I read about their faith and then it says this, all these were still living by faith when they died. They didn't just believe for a day or two. When they died, they were still believing because they never saw the promises fulfilled. And listen what it says now in that same chapter. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised to them. God had planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are not dead. I've seen the tombs of their bodies in Hebron. But they're not dead. Jesus said God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Not was, is. He's not the God of dead people. He's the God of the living. And we are worshipping the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They're still alive. And without us, they will not be made perfect. And they are among the great cloud of witnesses that's watching how we run because their perfection, their fulfillment of God's promises is dependent on us too. We're all going to come into it together. When Jesus comes back to earth, you'll see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob coming back with, them, with him and together with us, made perfect in God's sight. All those weaknesses taken away and perfectly reflecting the image of God.